This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. I'm Emma Keeling in Oxford, where a biotech company is switching off the fat-creating genes in our livers. And I'm Shanice O'Mara, finding out how 3D X-ray imaging of ancient mummies is inspiring engineering. It's a silent killer, also described as a hidden health epidemic. Fatty liver disease. The early signs are subtle, but if left untreated, they can cause a variety of illnesses, including diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and even some types of dementia. There is no cure, no treatment, other than changing to a healthier lifestyle. But there is hope. Fatty liver disease can be deadly. Around a quarter of all people suffer from some form of this disease, and there's a critical shortage of donor transplants. But a biotech company in Oxford is hoping to change this by developing a genomic medicine that can switch off fat-causing genes. Wayne Eskridge is not an unusual case. Poor diet and exercise saw his weight increase over the years. My doctor wasn't concerned. Uh, I wasn't concerned. Uh, I, I didn't uh, didn't realize the risk that I was taking. What he didn't know was his liver was also building up dangerous levels of fat. The thing about the liver is that it's so tough. It's very forgiving. You can just beat the heck out of it, and it just keeps working. I was incidentally identified during an operation in 2010 for a gallbladder removal. And the surgeon at that time uh, came out and told my wife that I had cirrhosis and I had maybe a couple of years to live. And this takes us into all the problems that people have with this disease because none of my blood tests showed that. Eventually, Wayne asked to see a liver specialist and discovered he had stage 4 cirrhosis that causes severe scarring and poor function, often seen at the terminal stages of chronic liver disease. His experience led him to set up the Fatty Liver Foundation in the US, where it's thought around 100 million have some form of fatty liver disease. I was very fortunate that at the last minute, uh, my doctor and my wife pulled me back and um, we changed our lifestyle. In England, at Oxford University in the Innovation Lab building, OkaBio co-founders Dr Quinn Wills and Jack O'Meara have developed a therapy they hope could successfully treat fatty liver disease and be delivered straight into the liver. The biggest problem by far really is that a lot of the problems we're looking at, like fatty liver disease, are silent killers. They're silent for 10, maybe 20 years before you present with complications, and then sometimes the therapies are just too little too late. Because the disease is so silent, the team couldn't figure out how to measure changes in trial patients. They soon realised that working in the transplant space could solve a lot of problems. So let me take you on the final part of this journey. If Ooh. you're squeamish, look away now. Yeah. So this is a fatty liver? This is a fatty liver. A perfusion machine can keep livers alive before transplant for up to 24 hours. At Birmingham Hospital, donated livers not healthy enough for transplant are put on this machine so they can be tested with Okabios therapy. All they need to do is inject the therapy into the blood, it circulates, goes into the liver cells, and by the time the liver is transplanted into the human, it's in the liver and stays in the liver for months at a time. The therapy contains instructions to switch off or turn down the genes creating fat. In future, they hope to be able to inject it straight into a patient. And so it's not cleaning it at all, it's just sort of making the fat less harmful. That's exactly it, boosting the metabolism so that over the months the liver is better at clearing out the fat, but it's also better at responding to the stresses that the fat might cause. Wow. And just one dose? One dose. Single medicine lasts for up to six months at a time. Incredible. 
Even though this genomic technology is still very much in the testing phase, consultant surgeon Dr. Heinek Mergenthal says it is promising. So if the, if the therapy does prove reliable and successful, how could that change transplant medicine? If we were able to treat the fattiness of the, of the liver disease, uh, that would be a game changer for having more transplantation, more donors available. But uh, in general, Transplantation is only a tip of iceberg because if we can treat the fatty liver disease on the machine or when outside the donor, we will be definitely able to treat the liver inside the human afterwards. So the need for transplantation would, would really decrease. But right now, the need for donor livers is desperate. We are starting accepting livers and donors, which we wouldn't consider 10 years ago because the liver disease has been increasing. There was been about a fourfold increase in liver disease over the couple last decades. So the need for transplantation is really booming. Unfortunately, one out of seven patients currently dies on the waiting list because there is no available donor for them. The liver is the largest solid organ in the body and is vital to the metabolic system as well as detoxification and the immune system functions. It also controls the body's ability to break down fats. While alcohol can affect a person's liver function, it's not totally to blame. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the term used for a range of conditions caused by a buildup of fat in the liver and is usually seen in people who are overweight or obese, but not always. It's also the main reason for needing a transplant in countries such as the UK and US and for the shortage of healthy donor livers. In medical science, biomarkers can be used as an indicator of disease. For example, blood pressure is a biomarker used to determine the risk of stroke. But when it comes to fatty liver disease, there's a lack of them, so researchers don't know if the treatment is working. Either you go into the lab and find biomarkers, or you find a way to do trials without the biomarkers. And the latter is really the solution we've gone for as a company. Instead, they're figuring out which genes cause dangerous fat and testing which has the greatest influence on disease development. So, Quinn, are you reprogramming livers? Yes, it's a very exciting time these days uh, you know, to completely change how we think about medicine. Traditional medicines really target proteins using small molecules. These days, many of us are directly targeting genes in the DNA and how they talk to the rest of the body to make really big changes for long periods of time. So how do you stop genes making fat? At the centre of a cell is the nucleus. Inside are thread-like structures called chromosomes. Each chromosome is made of a single molecule of coiled DNA that carries the genetic blueprint of the proteins that the cell needs to make. Whenever the blueprint is read, messages are sent from the nucleus to the cell, telling it which proteins to make and how much of each. These messages are sent using another molecule called RNA. It's some of these messages that Dr. Will's team is trying to block. They do this by making a synthetic, long-lasting mirror version of the specific RNA message they're trying to block. They also add a signal on the end of the mirror message, so when it's floating around in the blood, it can find and attach to liver cells. The liver cells take in the synthetic mirror message, which binds to the natural message, causing it to break down. By doing this, they are dialing down specific proteins that are in excess when the liver is full of fat. This type of medicine is called RNAi, or RNA interference. It's a big breakthrough, not just at Okabio, but in deep phenotyping in general. The ability now to be able to study genomics at the level of cells, which we couldn't do, uh, six, seven years ago is equivalent to when the physicists began smashing atoms to see what's inside. Traditional genetics connects DNA with disease, but Dr. Wills and his team argue that it doesn't answer important questions about chronic disease, such as what the gene is doing, at what stage in the disease it plays a role, and in which organ. Their technique, known as deep phenotyping, does just that by imaging and sequencing organs at incredible detail from healthy individuals all the way to very ill patients, they build models of how changes in our genes, cells and organs over time eventually result in disease. We start off with liver biopsies and we're working together with transplant surgeons here in Oxford to, uh, to image and genotype and sort of analyse the genes for thousands and thousands of samples. Here's a good example of how we do it. You can see two liver biopsies here. 
And if you look very carefully, you can even see regions where the liver is beginning to break down. So we use imaging AI to really scan all of these images and identify thousands of these types of features that we think are important. So here imaging AI is identified in these blue regions, areas that we call uh, ballooning degeneration, which we believe is important in this disease. It's these cells in particular that we're trying to understand because we believe they are the cells that connect fatty disease with eventually fibrosis and cirrhosis. How do you figure out which genes are actually creating this fat? By using these methods, we build up a very detailed computer model of what we believe the liver is doing and which genes are going up or down or changing the behavior in response to or driving the fat changes in the liver. So you're feeding data into the computer and it's the computer that's telling you which genes you need to hone in on. Absolutely, right down to individual genes and individual sequences of genes if we need to. But it's up to the scientists to test human cells to see how they respond to different levels of fat. This is Kenny. What he does is he's testing out the ideas that we got from the computer and the predictions in little micro livers that we culture in those trays. I mean, you say micro livers, I'm expecting to see, you know, lots of, but these are actually sort of what cells, liver cells. Liver cells. If you look a little bit closer over here, you can see what they look like with fat. We're showing the fat in green. These are, this is a close up on a micro liver where the cells are building up fat. We've shut down one of the genes on the left to build up more fat to understand what happens when fat builds up. And on the right, we've shut down a gene that we think might make for a good therapy because it turns down the level of fat that the cells are accumulating. 50% of obese people who have liver transplants because of fatty liver disease redevelop it within a year. Dr. Wills wants to prevent that by giving the therapy every six months and ultimately giving it to those living with a fatty liver that have yet to develop complications. He also wants to dial genes up as well as down. There are genes that really speed up how uh, fat is metabolized in your cell. And those ones we really, really do want to augment. It's just a much tougher problem than switching ones off at the moment. Okabayo is hoping their research will not only save lives, it will give the doctors and surgeons greater insights so they can tailor the medicines to the patient. We're building this thousand liver atlas. It'll be the most detailed genomic atlas of the liver that's been developed to date to really study what's happening in, a, in the liver at a genetic level. This is a first step towards really mapping out the body at a cellular level and how cells not just function normally, but how they start functioning as you start uh, developing too much fat, as you become obese, as your cholesterol levels go up, as your blood pressure changes, and how those in some individuals might improve your risk or, you know, or worsen your risk in terms of getting a disease. The Atlas is a collaboration with Oxford University and the data will be publicly released at the end of 2022. Not long after, they hope for the first time to be able to treat a transplant liver just before it goes into a patient. Wayne Eskridge saved his life through diet and exercise, but for many, that won't be enough. In the US, there's 100 million Americans who have fatty liver. Today, it is steadily moving into the younger generations. We're, we're getting it earlier and earlier in life. We badly need effective drug therapy. It's going to be devastating to medicine and, you know, not just medicine. I mean, it, it's devastating to society and families and people because chronic illness is a nasty way to die. You can see more of Razor on our YouTube channel. Search for Razor Science Show and it will take you straight there. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda Podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. While many countries battle a difficult second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, a light at the end of the tunnel has been offered by the rapid approval and rollout of several new vaccines. 
Previously, it has taken many years to develop and bring to market new vaccines. But with a global emergency, large amounts of funding and willing trial participants, scientists have been able to offer a range of vaccines in just a year. Many of these are pioneering next generation technology, which can be rapidly scaled up to meet global demand. To start, we can look at how vaccines are traditionally produced. Classically, eggs are used to cultivate viruses. It's a method that has been applied for over 70 years and is used to develop either live attenuated or inactivated vaccines. Live attenuated vaccines use a weakened form of the virus where the capacity to cause disease is minimised or the ability to replicate is prevented. Inactivated vaccines are killed by applying either heat, acid or radiation. The weakened or killed virus is then injected into people, activating the body's immune response to provide protection against disease. For the virus SARS-CoV-2 and its disease COVID-19, there are currently a few inactivated vaccines being used. Two examples are the Sinovac vaccine, approved for emergency use in China and Brazil, and Bharat Biotech vaccine in India. This is still the most common approach to developing vaccines. But there are now four other types of vaccines being used against SARS-CoV-2. Genetic, viral vector, protein subunit, and virus-like particles. The majority target the exact same part of the virus. This is the spike-like structure or spike protein on the surface of the virus which binds to human cells and allows the genetic code to enter and infect the cell. How each type of vaccine targets the spike protein differs. The most revolutionary are genetic and viral vector vaccines. Genetic vaccines inject DNA or mRNA code for just the spike protein directly into the body. Both Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech use this method and were some of the first vaccines to receive widespread regulatory approval for emergency use. To protect the genetic code, a lipid nanoparticle coat surrounds the mRNA. This unstable molecular protection is the reason why the vaccine needs to be kept at extremely cold temperatures. After injection, the lipid coat fuses with a cell, allowing the mRNA to enter the cytoplasm and start coding for the spike protein. Both the spike protein and spike fragments protrude from the cell. When the cell dies, these spike proteins trigger the immune system to provide protection. But we'll come back to this later. Viral vector vaccines use another virus as a vehicle or vector for carrying the code into the body. It's often an adenovirus, a common virus that causes mild cold or flu. As it's more stable than a lipid coat, viral vector vaccines can be kept at refrigerated temperatures. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine uses a chimpanzee adenovirus that has previously been shown to have no effect on humans. It contains the modified RNA spike sequence for SARS-CoV-2, but translated into the DNA code of the adenovirus. The adenovirus vector vaccine is injected into the body. When it reaches a cell, the genetic code is released and makes its way to the cell nucleus. An mRNA strand is produced, which is ejected into the cytoplasm, where it is read and coded into SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins that fill the cell and protrude from the exterior. When the cell dies, releasing the spike proteins and fragments, it triggers the immune system. The immune system contains antigen-presenting cells, which can engulf loose spike proteins from a dead cell and present the fragments on its surface. Another vital immune cell, a T helper cell, detects the spike protein fragments on the antigen presenting cell and activates. At the same time, another immune system cell, a B cell, also detects the spike protein from the vaccine or dead cell, engulfing it to display the spike fragments on its surface. When an activated T helper cell reaches a B cell with the spike protein fragment on its surface, it activates the B cell, causing it to produce antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that can attach themselves to the spike protein. If someone is exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, antibodies bind to the virus spikes, blocking it from infecting a cell and preventing COVID-19 disease. It's worth noting that the immune system is a very complex topic, simply expressed here to show how a combination of many cells and systems dictate the strength and length of vaccine protection or immunity.
Although they've been in development for decades, this is the first time both viral vector and genetic vaccines have been approved for use in people and marks a turning point for the future of other new vaccines and treatment options. To ensure they're safe and effective, all vaccines undergo a strict clinical trial process from preclinical to phase one, two and finally three. To speed up the trial process for the COVID pandemic, some of these phases are run concurrently. All the clinical data is gathered and submitted to regulatory bodies who decide whether a vaccine is approved based on safety and efficacy. The efficacy percentage, which is often cited, is a particular calculation based on the number of volunteers who test positive for COVID-19 and not on the number of people out of 100 who are protected by the vaccine. In the case of Pfizer-BioNTech, 43,661 volunteers were recruited to the trial and split into two groups, vaccine and placebo. 170 people in the trial tested positive for COVID-19. Of those, eight had received the vaccine and 162 had received a placebo. Researchers calculate the fraction of those who got sick in both the vaccine and placebo group. They mathematically find the difference between the two fractions and determine the efficacy percentage. If the fractions are the same, it would be 0%. In the case of Pfizer, they calculated it as 95%. It's a good indication of how well a vaccine works, but not that 95 out of 100 people are protected. Real-world effectiveness, complicated by many factors, can be very different. It's not always the first vaccines to market that are the best. Many other vaccines are still going through clinical trials and could provide stronger or longer immunity, have better safety profile, or be cheaper and easier to produce and distribute. There are two other types of vaccines not yet discussed that are in clinical trials for SARS-CoV-2, virus-like particles and protein subunits. Virus-like particles, or VLPs, are currently used for a handful of other vaccines. They work because of their resemblance to the virus, but contain no core genetic material that causes disease. On their surface are exact replicas of the virus spike proteins, which, when injected, will trigger the body's immune response. For SARS-CoV-2, Canada-based Medicago has developed a plant-based VLP currently in Phase 2 clinical trials. Protein subunit vaccines are already used for a few viruses, such as the human papillomavirus, or HPV, where some strains can cause cervical cancer. The spike proteins of the virus are grown and harvested. These can either be injected or constructed into nanoparticles and given as a vaccine. For SARS-CoV-2, Maryland-based Novavax has developed a nanoparticle protein subunit vaccine that is currently in Phase 3 clinical trials. The speed at which these vaccines have not only been developed and approved, but also produced on a massive scale is a remarkable feat of science. As the pandemic shifts gear with the arrival of new variants, there is some concern that this could impact the effectiveness of vaccines. But there is hope. These new vaccine methods are based around the genomic sequencing of the virus, utilising its genetic code to produce the spike protein. This means that with new variants, the code can be updated, whilst the processes remain the same, meaning new updated vaccines can be developed and produced rapidly, helping us keep one step ahead of the global pandemic. Some of the most exciting advances in science come because of collaborations across different disciplines. In this case, the cooperation between a mechanical engineer and an Egyptologist opens up a new window into the past and also inspires a whole field of innovation through biomimicry. Professor Richard Johnston is based in the engineering department at Swansea University. So how does engineering connect with ancient mummies? So on our previous campus, the engineering building was actually right opposite our Egypt Centre, which is an Egyptology museum, and kind of recently got a new X-ray microtomography machine, which we would use in engineering to look at things like jet engine parts or composite materials, typically human-made structures. But I knew someone who was in Egyptology and I'd been talking to them, um, and they passed me on to the Egypt Centre. 
when I saw the animal mummy samples that were down there, we just thought, actually, that's perfect for X-ray technologies. The X-ray microtomography machine is similar to a medical CT scanner, but generating three-dimensional images 100 times greater in resolution. This allows the animal's remains to be analysed in extraordinary detail, right down to the smallest bones and teeth. Historically, they'd actually physically unwrap mummified samples to see what's inside, and obviously that's incredibly destructive, whereas by non-destructively X-ray imaging, everything stays in that same position that it was thousands of years ago. For the first time ever, the young scientists could peer into the undisturbed centres of some of the artefacts in the museum, time capsules into the past. A mummified cat yielded a surprising discovery. It looks like an adult cat's size, but actually the wrappings are really thick. And when you get down to it and you see that skull that's inside, it's a lot smaller. It was effectively a kitten. Virtual reality software meant that I could see different things within that data. So now I would literally put myself virtually within the mummified animal. I essentially make the mummified animal as big as my house. And I'm effectively touring through that, wandering through it, looking for a fracture or a break that we hadn't seen before when we'd been looking at 3D data on a 2D screen. The researchers made a 3D printout of the snake skull to give to a biologist, who was then able to identify it as a juvenile Egyptian cobra. Even if we'd unwrapped that mummified package, we would have ended up with a skull around this big, which is actually quite difficult to, to get the species from. So being able to then scale that up and 3D print it to something this large was really, really useful. <laughs> This immersive approach was able to throw a new light on ancient Egypt. Some of the, the work we did, again, years after getting the data, it was really once delving deep into that 3D volumetric data inside virtual reality, it was really, really useful for trying to understand more about the animals and to give the right information to the experts that we were working with. Did you ever think when you were examining jet engine components using the same technology that it would lead to this kind of investigation? Not at all, actually. Um, through this project, it's, it's shown the power of X-ray technology for, for me, and so I work far more outside of engineering now. I work, I, we're scanning birds, insects, human tissue. We're looking at lots more than just those engineering materials now. Professor Johnston now leads a team focusing on bio-inspiration, creating powerful images of tiny creatures. They're able to draw ideas from nature which can have a practical use in mechanical engineering. We've been imaging a plant hopper, so it was discovered that they have uh, mechanical gears between their legs. We're the first to kind of see them in three dimensions and try and understand their shape because they don't look like human design gears at all. So we're trying to understand if evolution has led to a improved gear shape that could be useful for engineering. Other species have inspired him too. We have a campus that has its own beach, and so it was a curiosity thing. We have barnacles very nearby. We x-rayed them. And it was when we did that, I came to the microscope and saw an image of one tiny bit of the barnacle, the microstructure, and I hadn't seen anything that looked like that since I was working on jet engine materials with Rolls-Royce. A jet engine has to be able to tolerate a great deal of stress from dramatic changes in temperature during use. A barnacle also survives in extreme conditions. It lives in the intertidal zone, so it's half of its time spent in the water, half of its time spent out to the water, usually with waves crashing on it, and so the biomineralization or the underlying microstructure of barnacle could be tailored to different mechanical constraints linked to its environment. If there are challenging environments, then you need to do very interesting things with the materials that make up those structures. So yeah, it's, it's strange how we see these parallels um, between nature and engineering. And typically nature got there first.